Right. Now, clearly there's going to be some issues concerning the measurement of willingness to pay. I've just briefly introduced the different methods. One problem that's been observed is something called sub-additivity effects. People's willingness to pay for some service or good A, plus their willingness to pay for some good or service B, typically is greater than their willingness to pay for A and B together. Now that's slightly unfortunate because it kind of means the way you ask the questions is going to influence the answer you get, as of course it's not surprising. Similarly, there's been observed sequence effects. If you ask people their willingness to pay for A followed by willingness to pay for B, you may get different answers than if you ask them about willingness to pay for B followed by willingness to pay for A. Again, a bit unfortunate from a measurement point of view. But probably the biggest problem is something described as scope insensitivity. And that is, um, people's willingness to pay is frequently rather insensitive to the magnitude of the outcome. Um, where this was first observed was actually in environmental economics, where um, people were asked how much they might be willing to pay to you know, protect breeding sites for some rare species. And so, you know, if you, how much are we willing to pay to ensure that, you know, 50 breeding pairs or whatever animal or bird we're thinking of um, were protected? And then if you ask them how much are we willing to pay if 50,000 breeding pairs were protected, their willingness to pay often hardly increased. Now, that may well be a true reflection of their preferences, or it might just be, yes, the true reflection of this insensitivity. They do genuinely value one more than another, but when they give their answers, the difference seems very small. And this has also been observed to some extent in the health context. Um, this was a study um, done in Denmark, uh, And it was looking at willingness to pay for um, reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. And so those, um, the first option, CV1, was reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease from two out of a thousand to one out of a thousand over a period of 10 years. And this was, restated to the individual as this would avoid, uh, our friend EQ5D, this would avoid this health state, um, two, 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 two. And that's some problems, mobility, some problems with youth activities, some problems, self-care, um, moderately anxious or depressed and uh, with some moderate discomfort. So that's the, the first program. It will lead to that benefit. The second program, CV2, again reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease uh, from two out of a thousand to one out of a thousand um, over a period of 10 years, but it avoided death. So in one case, you haven't changed the risk of death, but you've changed the, the, the risk of, of a particular ill health outcome, but in the second one, it was described in terms of changing the risk of death. And so what they used was a dichotomous choice question, and also they followed that with a payment card question. And what they found was rather interesting. Um, it's <coughs> Danish krona. Ooh, I'm not sure. I, I want to say about 10 yen to the krona, but I'm, I'm not a currency expert. Uh, So what they found, so first of all, there's two dichotomous choice and then payment card. If we look first of all at dichotomous choice data, the mean willingness to pay implied by people's dichotomous choices 
was about 7,000 kroner for the first program, uh, about just over 9,000 kroner for the second program. If we look at their mean willingness to pay using the payment card method, it was about half as much. So that's one problem, one method giving different values, but uh, about 3,200 kroner for the first pr program, CV1, slightly over 4,000 kroner for CV2. Now, the um, ratio of qualities that are being gained between the two programs was calculated as about 2.22. In other words, this second program was saving or generating, depends how you want to look at it, about twice as much, slightly more than twice as many qualities. Uh, but if we look at the ratio of these willingness to pay, they're not 2.222. On the payment cards, it was 1.26. On the Recosmos choice, it was 1.32. So there's a degree of insensitivity there. We would rather hope, perhaps, if our methods were robust, that um, these values in the bottom line would be at least twice as much as the top line, and, and they're not. But it's worse than that. <laughs> they then looked at the individual valuations of uh, the two programs, and they found that 68% of the respondents valued, gave the same willingness to pay. Now remember, one program is producing twice, more than twice the benefit of another program, but 68% gave exactly the same willingness to pay. 26.6% at least got it in the right direction. They had a willingness to pay for CV1, which was less than CV2. And 5% didn't even get the direction right. 5% valued CV1 more highly than CV2. Is this a problem with logic or non-communication? Um, I, well, or scope insensitivity. But I mean, the bottom bit is more than scope insensitivity. It's sort of just getting things wrong. Um, I think it's reflecting that these are unfamiliar questions and they're not easy to think about and to answer. We are used to going into the supermarket and making a decision, oh, that cake looks very nice, oh, but it's costing, am I willing to pay? Or that bit of beef or something looks great, but am I willing to pay that amount? We're quite used to that, but we're maybe not used to um, this health program will reduce these risks and produce this benefit. This program will have a different set of characteristics. How much am I willing to pay? So it's unfamiliarity partly. But of course, that's always going to be a problem in the health context. Um, now, I, uh, as I noticed sort of or mentioned in passing, <laughs> the payment card produced rather different results from the dichotomous choice. And uh, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that different methods give different answers. And it's partly because there are different potential biases with different methods. Now, the payment card is particularly subject to what's called midpoint bias um, and something sometimes called range bias. Midpoint bias is the, the description given to the phenomenon that individuals feel much more comfortable picking a value near the middle. They really don't, most individuals, really don't like going to the extremes. Now, one can understand that. Um, I've noticed it, uh, particularly in Japanese society, on um, subway trains. If there's a choice of where to sit down, a Japanese person almost always, this is not midpoint bias, it's the opposite, they will sit in a corner seat. So there's a bench, they'll sit in one of the corners. They'll just about never sit in the middle. Well, it's the same thing going on here, but let's flip it. 
Um, starting point bias. Um, <coughs> clearly, starting point bias is a problem. Uh, in the Burkina Faso experiment, because we randomized the starting points, we were able to test it. And we did find starting point bias. So if you started with a low bid, a low value, you ended up at a relatively low value. If you started at a high value, you ended up at a relatively high value. Because of course, people don't want to keep saying yes, 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 or no, no. They learn that the only way to stop the questions is to change the answer. And so um, definitely that does happen, particularly in bidding games. Take it or leave it, or if you uh, like um, dichotomous choice, is a more formal name for it, is subject to something called yeah saying. And this is a phenomenon where individuals, again, I don't want to generalize, but most individuals would rather just say yes. I've often used this as an experiment. I then turn to somebody in the front row and say, um, shall we go for coffee after the lecture? And most of the time, the person will go, Yes. Sometimes you get a vociferous sort of no and a sort of alarm. <laughs> but so I won't do it today. Um, but if you ask somebody something in a polite way and a, you, you know, your body language is sort of right, chances are they're going to say yes. Uh, I mean, it's that's just the way people are, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, that's my, that might make life go a bit easier. You know, we're not always rough edges rubbing up against each other. But it doesn't help when you're doing a willingness to pay study. You want to know what people genuinely feel, what their valuation really is. And if there's yes saying going on, you're going to get uh, a misleading um, answer. Final one on this list, strategic bias. This describes a situation where people think they can change the outcome through their answer. Uh, for example, in the community-based health insurance, people might think, well, look, if I really give my true value, I might have to pay this. Whereas if I come in low with a low valuation, it's less likely that I'll have to pay so much as possible. Or, or people might think the other way. They might think that um, if I value this, give quite a low valuation, it may never be on offer. But if I give a high valuation, they may bring it in. So there's, there's these things. And th again, this has been tested. There's a very famous, um, uh, a very famous study in Swedish to do with comedy programs, but that takes me too far away. I, I better not go there. Um, but so st people answer strategically, sometimes. <laughs>